Matthew Peirce, who is the chair of the Open Geospatial Consortium Discrete Global Grid Systems Domain or Standards Working Group or both? Uh, both. <laughs> so there are also both groups are also there. And um, Ma Matthew has uh, graciously, um, uh, how to say, accepted to, to tell us a little bit about the standardization efforts around DGGS um, that are currently happening in the international sphere. Thanks. Thanks, Matt, for coming. Cool. cool. So just before I um, um, share my screen. Um, Wait, I think I have to make you co-host one second. Uh, yep. So um, where um, where is everybody up to in all this? Because I've got I've I've got a um, presentation that Robert Gibbon and I co. Um, so uh, I, I gave a I gave a theoretical background on sort of from an academic viewpoint on on okay. presentation and those type of things. Yep. Um, and uh, with a bit of practical things, I think standardization okay. would be interesting yep. regarding I don't know. I saw the, the time data cube type thing, services. Yep. Okay. So, well, I'll kind of attempt to um, bounce off that um, and um, cover um, sort of where that leads into um, the standard space. And if, if I uh, get time, I'll, um, I'll touch on sort of, I guess, where probably the the, the new frontier in terms of DGGS and that's um, and that's in the um, API space. So um, now let's if I share my screen. Uh, share, share. Okay, now does everyone see that? If I um, yes, slide show and okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so this this. Um, presentation was well quite a lengthy um, um, sort of seminar that um, Robert and I gave to the UN. Um, uh, was it um, ECE the um, their, the standards? Uh, well, the, the statistical standards um, sort of body um, about sort of DGGS and where we're where we're going with the um, uh, with the standards. So, um, um, but most of the most of the stuff we covered in there um, about a month or so ago is highly relevant now. Um, okay, so I take it we've covered um, reference systems and the, the, the switch to from referencing by coordinates to referencing by identifiers. Um, and that's um, so what you saw with um, Perry's presentation is a demonstration of um, the power. That's the real power of DGGS is that you can actually abstract away the coordinate sort of wrangling to a set of identifiers, which is a much nicer um, place to be from a, um, a data and a computer uh, perspective. Um, so, yeah, so I won't, won't dwell too much on, on these. If you've got any questions, um, yeah, feel, feel free to, to pipe up because I'm always happy to answer those. Um, so I'll just screen through these because um, this this talk went into some of the backgrounds and the differences be between the um, the different ways of referencing and the standards the ISO and OGC standards that support those different approaches such as um, what you see up on the screen there um, uh, and there's some examples and identifiers can be anything from an index to a name um, as opposed to um, some form of, of structured um, um, sort of number numbering system. Um, um, yeah, yeah, and that's that's one of the things that led to the whole DGGS, I guess, movement um, over the last you know, sort of you know, fifteen, nearly twenty years now, is the the uh, the realization that the way that we've been managing spatial data. Is not it just doesn't cut it, um, and it's um, it's creating more problems and more barriers than it's solving, and that's where. Um, so I guess the the thinking behind um, DGGS sort of came um, came about. So again, with um, the way we I guess the GIS um, mantra that that we've been stuck with since the nineteen fifties. 
has separated data out into its different different constituents and set those as different complete different data types and data structures and of course when you try to to um, drive interoperability and combine all these different data sets together you've got a problem because you've got not only coordinate reference system problems but you also have data structure problems and so you've um so on the vector side of the world you've got points you've got lines you've got polygons they're all kind of related but they're um but their their file structures um are different and not always um, um sort of um, play nicely together but one of the Big, biggest problems with, I guess, the, the GIS approach to, to data is everything is all um, variable. So there is no there is no sort of, I guess, overarching structure that that um, enables you to, to um, search through and do comparisons. You've got to you've got to do everything at the sort of um, uh, for comparisons. You've got to, uh, for example, um, uh, this this one here. If you're looking to to see, well, is that point inside the polygon? Well, you've got to you've got to compute that. You've got to compute that, and if that's a really large, a really complex polygon, that can take a lot of compute effort. But if the polygon lives in um, in a particular DGGS cell and has has an identifier attached to it, and that point lives in a DGGS cell and has that same um, identifier mapped to it, the the problem or the challenge of saying well is this point inside the polygon becomes uh, can become a very simple um, problem of um, well which um, which uh, will do the do the identifiers match do the do the indexes match if they match then then the, then they are overlapping or or um, contained by or, or whatever so that those complex geospatial problems become trivial um, sort of from the the DGGS perspective and of course um you sort of this can be leveraged um sort of through point cloud analysis and through tagged um and sort of uh, geotagging of of um social media feeds and, and everything where instead of tagging a a lo physical location latitude longitude you could you could be tagging a a DGGS identifier which again would um vastly simplifies um, that correlation process. And this is sort of where the topology of DGGS really sort of comes to the fore. Um, now on the other on the other side of things, on the raster in the raster world, um, well we've um, we, um, we we break things up into into grids, we structure them as grids. We like to think to ourselves that the that that an image is made up of square pixels. Um, the reality is that they're actually triangular because of the computer graphics and how that works. But um, but we we put ourselves into this mental mental image, and then um, and I guess one of the real advantages of of that real structured and rigid structure um, of um, of a of a raster or, or, a, or an image is that you can do array processing on it. Um, so you um, you can get massive increases in in efficiencies of, of processes, um, and likewise um, uh, when you um, um, when you want to subset or do or do do comparisons, you can do that on a grid grid fashion. And of course, a DGGS being a grid structure or tessellation allows you to do that. Um, but it, with a DGGS, you're not just restricted to square structures. You can have squares, you can have triangles, you can have have um, pentagons, you can have hexagons, um, um, you can even have diamonds. Um, they're kind of the fundamental sort of shapes um, um, that um, most DGGSs um, have. But you've got a wider range of complexity, and I'm sure we've, what Perry has shown is is that different structures um, have different properties regarding like how well they nest and and uh, coalesce around um, around features and objects. Um, but of course, um, uh, yeah, we go. Um, so, but of course, the um, when we want to try to do um, um, inter interoperability or or to combine raster data and vector data, that's always that's always been the problem of 
Well, you've either got to rasterize your vector or vectorize your raster so that you have apples and apples that you can do a computation of uh, and, in, and an integration to actually um, um, combine them. Well, a DGGS allows you to step aside from that because it has a hierarchical multi-resolutional structure um, that, is, that, that is fixed. Um, that allows these sort of rapid array process sort of um, algorithms, but it is um, um, it's able to be to um, be a reference. So it can be a reference for vector objects. It can be a reference for for pixels or parts of an image, um, and it's that it's by that referencing that sort of loose loosely couple coupling allows you to do this this integration without having to do any any massaging of data. Um, and it, it purely becomes a lookup um, fashion. And so the, the capabilities of DGGS are really, are really um, astounding. And, um, but so sort of prior to about, um, uh, what's it now? Um, well, nearly, yeah, 10 years ago, um, 10, 15 years ago, most um, DGGSs were, they were academic curiosities. There was, there was no standardized way of just defining these things or implementing them, um, and that's where that's where we've um, where um, so we, we've stepped in to fill the gap from the OGC perspective of going well. Um, these these um, uh, data infrastructures have a, um, a vast amount of, of benefit to uh, to give to people and to the um, the community, but um, there is no standard. Well, let's let's build one so that they. So that we can now build all of the different flavors of grid grid system out there, but build them in a way that they all have a common a sort of a, a, a common topology and a common structure that allow that will allow and facilitate um, interoperability, not just with conventional data and DGGSs, but also across DGGSs. Um, okay, and so I'll just um, screw it. So this is sort of going into more of the the ins and outs. Um, um, and Robert's journey and um, on the the topology aspects of indexing um, and why why it's important. Um, uh, yeah, and so this has led to um, abs uh, the OGC abstract specification, which is a foundational standard, uh, topic twenty one, and we've uh, um, in the last uh, three years we've sort of we've battled to. Uh, to get that standard, that international standard, also published as an ISO um, standard. And earlier this year, um, in January, um, the ISO 19170 um, Part 1 was, um, uh, was published, which is a, um, a, a car virtually carbon copy of the, the, the next version of the standard, which is about to um, um, go through the publication process on the OGC side. Now, um, so fundamentally, um, topic, uh, topic 21 um, refers to um, zonal identifiers. So it's a structured geometry, structural, structured identifiers as a way of referencing. Um, now, okay, yep, um, so that's that. And so li like I said before, um, so in a more arm wavy fashion, with the DGGS, you can map your, D, your DGGS structure to all of these different features. And then once they're mapped, then, then you have that ability to, to compare and combine um, data or parts of features and objects um, purely based on their index correlation, which is immensely powerful, um, especially in the, in the, um, the era of, of not just big data, but huge data. Um, and again, on the on the rest side of things, we can um, we can do the same. Um, and um, yeah, I mean the re the rest of ones is, is the easy one. The it's the um, combination between um, um, rasters and vectors is the um, um, is the trick. And of course, um, when we start to um, I won't labour on this. This is quite a lot to take in, and it'll take me a bit to to drill out. But what Robert sort of did when he was re uh, so I guess expanding on on the original standard version one was he started looking at the um, the topological um, uh, relationships and 
what um, what type of um, topological functions you'd have, whether you're looking for tiles of cells or, or lists of cells or zone or collections of zones and, and how that relates to the conventional, our conventional idea of spatial features, whether it's points, mod, um, polygons, et cetera, et cetera, to show that there is a clear mapping between um, what, people conventionally understand in space in the spatial science and I guess the DGGS way of, of um, approaching it. Um, yeah, so, and, and I guess the, the simple message of this slide is the, with the traditional or conventional uh, um, reference system approach, um, you've got increased complexity there when you're trying to deal with data and deal with multiple data. Whereas on the DGGS side, a lot of that complexity is still there, but it's been abstracted away from the end user and the analysis. And so you get that simplicity, which is, which is really important. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, so topic 21 defines a whole raft of, of uh, functional operators. So, it's, so it defines not only the, the basis for, um, um, for building a, um, like the, the structure of a, of a DGGS engine, but it also provides the, the high level, um, I guess, model for um, to define the, um, um, the, func the functions, the, the operators. So how do, you, how do you make this structure? How do you make it work? Um, and so these, this is sort of where the, the concept of the zonal identifier and the various um, sort of topological relationships um, come in. So you've got buffers, you've got differences, intersections, et cetera, et cetera, which can all be done um, through DGGS, but, not, but from the perspective of, of um, the identifier. And of course, there is the um, hierarchical um, functions that a DGGS has where you can traverse up and down through through the hierarchy of um, from parent uh, parent cells to to child cells, um, or across um, at any one of these levels. Um, looking at siblings, you can do tests of well, um, is this a is this cell a child of that cell, um, or a parent of, or a sibling of, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, plus. We can also sort of move into, um, I guess, more directional um, um, sort of operators um, uh, through through the um, the benefits of this fixed and structured, um, um, I guess, infrastructure that a DGGS is. Um, so you can start to look at sort of um, relate positions and relative positions in order to do that, and then sort of um, so I guess the zoom levels and the, the sort of level of detail. Um, Equivalent. This this looks scary. It's a wall of text, um, but um, fundamentally, it's um, what Robert um, was was doing here was just show was trying to show that um, sort of the these are the different types of of functions, and these sort of there's there is a commonality between many of these um, these these functions, and largely it boils down to. Um, to the ability to, to derive a direct position um, of a of a DGGS cell, uh, because that cell is structured and you know where it is, but um, as well, uh, well from that um, zonal identifier. So you can actually you can find you can find the cell from its position, or you can find the cell from its identifier, and then you can do functions on it um, and and operations. Um, um, yeah. So um, yeah, so this is where where we start to get into the application of um, things, and we'll see if this uh, plays well. Yeah, so uh, uh, the graphics is um, uh, playing up, but so essentially what I've described thus far is, um, and and this I like to, to sort of call the the DGGS on a page, um, and I'm I'm sure we've sort of covered this, so I won't delve on it too much but essentially you've got sort of the the fundamental structure that you've um, that uh, derives a DGGS and and leads to um, in the um, in the case of part one of the standard equal area um, uh, area equalization and you've got the different flavors that 
sort of your, your different starting points for how you define your DGS um, sort of derive. Um, you've got the benefits of, of the indexing and, and the fact that by using structured indexing, um, um, most DGSs that I'm aware of use some form of space filling curve to organize um, those cell, in, cell indices. And what that does is that allows you to convert a complex multi-dimensional search problem into a one a one dimensional array process um, that that groups data that's that's relatively close to each other from a in in terms of its um, yeah so you get na clumping of of neighboring um, observations and neighboring cells along this one dim one um, one dimensional uh, array of course one dimensional arrays are much easier for a computer to um, uh, to process. And because we're dealing with um, similar topologies and the same types of units, it means that you can break these, um, these processes up and make them massively parallel, um, which then makes them sort of inherently scalable in the, in the big data and the high performance computing um, space. Um, okay, I'm just trying to remember what, yeah, so, um, so some of the stuff I've, I've talked about already are sort of is covered here, but when we're dealing with co the conventional approach, trying to compare different data sets, in this case, it's different statistical um, census sort of boundaries across, across different um, census periods, um, including different um, um, uh, reporting processes and all of that. And that becomes a really difficult problem. As you can see um, here, I mean, you've got vastly different um, polygons, and you'll try um, from a statistician's perspective. You might be trying to um, uh, to work out well how do these correlate, or how have they changed? That can be quite difficult, um, especially when you're trying to do um, complex spatial um, uh, computations on um, on those irregular polygons. Um, now, uh, so the DGGS, um, and, and that provides provenance, uh, provenance challenges, precision errors, um, and um, uh, aggregated and numerated sort of, yeah, it's, it's all non-trivial non and there's, there's prone, prone to um, lots of errors. Um, but of course, um, if, we, um, if we look at it from a DGGS perspective, and it's a bit hard to see all of that on the screen, I apologize for that, um, but, um, your DGGS can can map these features, and then through a very simple index um, comparison process, um, you can do this job um, in a much a much cleaner, much more systematic way. And that's where and that's the benefit of um, that um, the OGC Topic Twenty One and ISO One Nine One Seven Zero provide us. Um, now, I'll, yep, let's too much and again the the fundamental um, thing about all this is bridging that raster vector divide and that's and the dgs provides that common geometry and now we've got a standardized way of doing that um across the world um now, yeah um yeah so and here are some of the yeah some of the reasons behind that we've got dgs that they're multi-resolutional they're simple but fixed geometries. They have global coverage. Um, the, the poles don't affect them. The international date line don't affect them. Um, you've got unique spatial identifiers and they can be operated in a, in a federated and multi-organizational um, um, infrastructure, which is um, increasingly becoming the norm. Um, okay, yeah, so this is more on the fundamentals. Um, Jurisdictions, and of course, yes. That's that's one of the things too. We uh, we start when when we have jurisdictional issues of uh, political boundaries. Data data sets often conform to those boundaries, and across those boundaries, your data may be in completely different uh, formats with different um, qualities of data, um, and it becomes really hard to integrate. With the DGGS, you can abstract that away and um, and sort of do that um, cross um, comparison of um, uh, cross jurisdictional uh, comparison, um, the same way as you as you would if you were just doing it uh, in a in a more simple scenario. The, it, it doesn't affect a DGGS infrastructure. So um, where we're heading with the standards. So um, 
Um, so I haven't covered on it too much, but so far the standards being um, the standards that, that have been defined are, um, um, I guess, more two-dimensional surface standards. One of the things that Robert um, Robert Gibb um, did in recasting um, uh, and, and developing version two of the standard is he took a really good and critical eye um, look at the um, at the data model, and he was able to to, to um, find a a harmonisation between not just space and time to create spatial temporal elements, but also multi-dimensional. Um, so now version two of the standard actually provides the the basis for us to then expand into higher dimensional DGGS um, standardization. So, so we are now in the um, in the early stages of drafting um, parts two, three, and four of the standard suite. So part two is um, is for equal volume. So it's volumetric DGGS. So, so where a, a surface DGGS maps the surface of the earth, a volumetric DGGS um, covers um, from the core into, into outer space. Um, um, and from a from an equal volume perspective instead of an equal area perspective, um, fundamentally the same topologies all apply, but your your geometries then um, are changing. Um, part three is a spatio temporal um, DGGS, and so that is um, that's where we sort of start um, looking at ways of of encoding um, time and uh, a temporal dimension into that indexing structure. So, uh, again, so that we move the complexity of working with time and space into the underlying um, infrastructure so that the analysis can be a lot, um, a lot simple, simpler. And part four um, is in recognition, it's um, to do with um, access aligned DGGSs um, in, across multiple dimensions as well. But one of the things that, with, that has emerged is there are, um, over the last few years is there are a number of DGGS-like infrastructures that are not equal area. They, they might be even just lat long grids. And so they, they have some inherent issues with them, which, make, which means that they're not considered to be a fully compliant DGGS. But nevertheless, they have all of the same topologies and they have all of those, those same um, sort of um, functionalities. And um, so, and with the work that Robert has done, it's, it's provided a way, a way for us to be able to, I guess, to stick, define how these, these other types of grid structures, well, how they actually relate to the, sort of the DGGS. So we, we, in some regards, it's broadening the, the general term of the DGGS, but now we've got like equal area DGGSs, um, equal volume DGGSs, spatio-temporal, um, DGGSs and access aligned DGGSs, um, and that's so. So that work is is um, currently um, 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 well, it's ongoing now, but it's um, it's it's in its fairly early stages for those subsequent parts. Um, and where we um, where we are heading now as well is into the um, I guess the next the next frontier in terms of that interoperability space. And that's the um, um, the I guess um, definition or the adoption of the open open um, API um, approach to spatial data. That is, it's all <laughs> it's, it's all the craze. So we thought we just hop on the bandwagon. But there are there are some really good and fundamental reasons why that's a good thing to do. Um, and what that does is um, and um, Perry's been uh, been one of the um, spearheads of of the early thinking on this. Uh, is um, well, early on we've had we had many discussions amongst the the, work, the working group. What happens when you're trying to to compare two very different styles of DGGS and compare data across them? And initially it was like, oh well, that's going to become a problem because of the inherent structures and. And then we sort of found, well, that's going to get us back into the same problem that conventional GIS space has. That was when that was when um, sort of Perry and, and a few of us took a step back, and it's like, well, 
there are some fundamental topologies here. It's some fu fundamental um, languages that are that occur in each of these these DGGS infrastructures that mean that we can we can um, sort of craft a a common language that would allow. Um, so I guess the someone at the at the um, at the client end or the the coalface of a developer at that coalface can write an a, a general a ger, general or a generic API of, of saying look I want to use a DGGS and I want to do this this function. Now in the back end, um, if it goes uh, you, depending on which DGGS you select, it will do its own its own sort of each engine will do its own way of of, of um, delivering on that that process request, but at the at the at the front at the top layer, um, you don't need to um, go into that complexity. So again, we're we're increasing the simplicity of, of working with DGGSs, and so at the moment, oh, and, and over the last eighteen months, um, there's been a lot of work done. Um, sort of expanding and extending on on the earlier work that uh, that Matt Perry and his team had done on this uh, through Testbed sixteen and um, and a couple of other funded projects, exploring um, how how would DGGS a, a DGGS API fit into the now in, sort of emerging and in, in parts maturing um, OGC API landscape and. Um, to, to our surprise, in a in a in a way, it was really easy. It's a really nice fit. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that is already there in those other API standards that that we can that we can harvest, and we don't we don't have to re reinvent. So that's that's awesome. Um, but when it comes to um, defining um, so well, how do you how do you manage the DGGS centric sort of top, topological functions? That actually that process actually becomes really simple, um, and that's that's uh, some of these earlier works have sort of kind of um, are demonstrating that. And so now what we're doing is um, is now we're embarking on on drafting that um, that um, generic standard for a DG for a D, DGGS API. So, um, so that that works um, just beginning now and was is looking to um, extend over the over the next um, um, probably sort of twelve maybe eighteen months depending on um, depending on how 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 long it takes us to get uh, get that drafting effort done. But that's yeah. so that's um, I guess a, a, a slightly uh, long and not non uh, or less focused uh, condensed uh, two at the same time. <laughs> yes, version that. Um, than what I'd uh, um, no, I think you did you did really well. Th thanks a lot, Matt. I think it's also really hard to anyway find the fo the focus um, from from which side to. There's so many things. There's OGC. Maybe not everybody's familiar with OG, OGC. I, you know, there's so many things, and you brought it. I think quite quite nicely together. Th thanks okay. a lot for that. No, Matt. Cool. Can I ask you? Would you would you be okay? Would you be able to join in around about one and a half hours? Um, for our sort of discussion session? Yes, I can. Maybe then we have yep. some more time to elaborate some of those specific yeah. things. Awesome. Can I ask, there's one question from the from the audience. I think yeah, yeah. it was um, meant for um, somewhere in between when you showed some examples for the Portugal census data. So it's a nice uh, specific yeah. data yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, question. How, how would DGS cope with the different sizes of the polygons and the distances between the polygon centroids. Um, uh, so, so in this this regard, between the centroids of those polygons or the centroids of the DGGS cells, I think that the distance between those of two, th those two sort of, uh, I think it, the degenerate question is aiming. Hi, sorry, I asked the question actually. I'm near. Yeah, it's some time um, ago. Sorry, yeah. No, maybe it's easier. But so. Um, what I could imagine if I was looking at these, um, looking at these uh, polygons, I might be interested. For example, I might look at say distances <laughs> between polygon centroids as a as a proxy for distances between the polygons. 
Uh, I might have some analysis that would have to cope with the different sizes. And I was trying to understand how I would um, how I'd cope with this in the in the in the in the DGGIS world, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, maybe. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, Med, you first, maybe. Okay. So, um, well, fundamentally, what um, what this is showing. So, those highlighted polygons there. Mm. Um, um, this particular example is where that is the same statistical unit identifier. Um, that has changed its boundaries and changed its size, its geographical size, um, due to changes in the demo demography over over between those census dates. Sure. Now, um, now the problem that that arises when you um, um, is that when you're trying to do that comparison, if you're trying to do it from an aerial perspective, mm -hmm. um, then then you've got to do a complex um, like you've got to Take those those two polygons and overlay them, and then do a um, a um, uh, like a geospatial um, uh, comparison of relative areas, um, which if uh, which can be simple or it can be really complex, especially if you've got slithers, if you've got if different um, instances of that data is in different coordinate reference systems or different map projections. Um, so you've got all of this extra complexity um, that, that goes along with that. Now, from the DGGS perspective, if, if you're, um, I guess you're looking for, well, what's the, what's the area of, of, of this feature and how has that area changed? Um, with the DGGS, instead of, um, instead of having to do that complex sort of geospatial process, all you need to do is you need to map each of those um, data sets to your DGGS mm. and at um, an appropriate level of, of resolution. And then the, the aerial um, sort of calculation literally becomes a summation of numbers. So essentially, it be, um, uh, and your, your uncertainty in your, in your um, calculation is defined by the resolution of the DGGS that you've gone down, like how far down in the DGGS you've gone. But um, but the actual um, function to comp to compute and compare the area of those two features literally is a uh, well, which um, well, give me give me all of the um, DGG all of the DGGS cells or zones that have a centroid that m fall inside inside this polygon. So once you've um, well, once you've mapped that polygon to it, it's just okay. Well, I've got this. Uh, I want to. I know this feature ID. So let's let's find this feature ID in our database, and mm -hmm. we've we've got a list of our DGGS cell identifiers, um, and we've got we've done that for both instances of that data, and then literally it becomes a well, how many um, how many cells at this at this resolution are in this version of the data? How many cells are in are in this one? Um, and then you can work out your relative um, difference in your area, um, as well as as a nominal um, uncertainty around that as well, because the the size of a DGGS cell gives you a, a proxy for an uncertainty analysis. Um, now, if you're doing different, like if you're doing distance um, metrics, then um, that's a that's a more complicated um, process, but again, it's um, it becomes a lot simpler in the DGGS context because again, each cell has a known um, uh, I guess topology and a known uh, relationship with the cells around it, and so so you know that um, in this direction, the um, cells will be this distance or that distance, um, and this is this is where hexagonal um, DGGS grids be, um, become really powerful because they have aerial, like um, for every, every cell that you, that you pick, um, all of the surrounding sort of direct neighbor cells are all exactly the same distance. Um, so that makes that even, even simpler. But even if uh, you're dealing with square or triangular, um, there, is a, there is a commonality um, between them. Um, so it's not as variable as, as one might think. 
Um, it's just a little bit more complex than the hexagonal system. Hexagonal systems are more complex in other aspects, but um, but you've got a you've got a known structure and a known um, um, sort of pathway, and so um, uh, traversing <laughs> along along a route, um, um, yeah, it becomes a um, uh, yeah, it's it's almost it's almost a dot to dot sort of um, approach, fly by numbers. <laughs> oh, and the same logic, basically, if you want to know the length of a boundary. Yeah, uh, identify adjacent polygons and so on. Yep, yep. And so, so yeah, and um, buffering. Um, so give me, and, and I've actually, um, um, well, whilst I was still at uh, Geoscience Australia, there was, um, we had a, 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 a classic challenge at this, at this point of um, the, um, the data cube was very good at, at picking um, observed water, um, water bodies from satellite imagery. But of course, what it's picking is is blobs, and so we can say here's here's a bunch of blobs. Um, and in Australia, being a um, a very drought a sort of um, uh, prone country, most of our rivers are actually pools uh, or collections of pools down at down a a, um, um, a depression. Really, <laughs> um, now that becomes really difficult when you're trying to do a GIS thing of going well. We, we want to find out which of these um, surface water bodies are farm dams and which ones are rivers when, when they kind of look like the same thing. And that's mm -hmm. the problem that um, I guess the, the, the unconstrained machine learning and data cube approach um, takes is because you don't have the context. With the DGGS, we were able to say, well, we, we've got um, data sets that have context. So we've got River systems, um, um, uh, sort of river catchment, um, um, sort of um, uh, data sets that can be mapped to to the DGGS. We've got we've got this Earth observation data that can be mapped to the DGGS. Well, now we can compare them and and just see. Well, um, and we uh, we want to we want to be able to see um, which of these which of these blobs that we that we found are within. 20 meters of the defined boundary of the river. Um, and, and the inference being that any, that farm dams will be more than 20 meters away. And we were able to do that really successfully. And uh, ef effectively it was, it was just through this index lookup of these different features based on the DGGS cells. And then to be able to go, well, um, at this level, right? This is, this is gonna give us our buffer um, and um, and so all of these blobs, these blobs are farm dams, and these blobs are part of the river system, even though they themselves are blobs rather than a, a big long sinuous river. Okay, may may I cut you both of it short? Yes. Yeah, again, I, I think because the topic lends itself really um, to to elaborate on, on, on a lot of those details. Uh, I, I totally agree that um, we could <laughs> we could carry oh, yes, this sorry, on yeah. for a while. <laughs> yeah. um, of course, yes. because we want to touch also the the adjacent topics, just to make sure that um, you know it's all seen in the right context. Yeah, but um, we have a little bit of a schedule, so uh, we also have to get our participants to do some of that work by themselves. Fantastic. So. Um, Thanks again for your presentation and, and, and for uh, answering the question, Matt. Uh, 